Welcome to All the Right Marketing, where we talk with business owners and industry leaders about marketing their programs and products. Our guests share tips that help anyone who loves stories and books, whether you are a librarian, bookseller, author, writer, publisher, teacher. The truth of the matter here is that the advice coming out of these conversations are for creative marketing across industries. And the current series that we're doing right now is very exciting to me because we are talking to educators about books in their classroom and about literacy. And so if you're listening to this and you are a writer or you are a publisher, I would recommend that you stay tuned in because this is our audience. This is one of our best audiences as educators. And then educators have the power to take those stories that we're producing and get them into the hands and the minds of littles. So today, my name is Maria Desmondi, owner of Cardinal Rule Press, publisher over there, and I have Jen Adams. Jen is a special education teacher who lives in central Pennsylvania. She has taught in multiple classrooms, grade levels, and settings, including regular education, special education, and alternative ed as well. She's taught pre-K first and fifth through 12th. So this is going to be a really great interview because she can speak to all different levels. Currently, she works for a public cyber charter, charter school, teaching students in grades one through nine in an autistic support virtual classroom. Welcome, Jen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So let's start off. Tell us about your experience um, teaching virtually right now. This sounds amazing. <laughs> and did it come out of the pandemic? Uh, well, yeah, it did. Um, just, you know, everything that um, happened with, you know, things going very virtual, um, the support and needs of my own family. You know, I'm sure a lot of us faced that. You needed to kind of reevaluate what your own family needed. Um, and it kind of gave me the opportunity to work from home more, which was great because I have two elementary age students or children, not students, children, <laughs> myself. Students um, as well. <laughs> well, yes. And so between my husband and I both being uh, small business owners as well on top, of our day-to-day -day jobs, we kind of needed that flexibility. So uh, going the cyber route for me allowed me to work from home. It allowed me to be there for my children when they needed it. And it was just what was best for our family at the time. But also just teaching virtually has kind of opened up a whole new idea of how I can reach students that I just didn't really think was possible. If I'm being honest, my mindset towards virtual cyber schools was not the best. But now that I've been able to kind of make it my own and do a lot of the things that I did before um, and see how I can get that to work and like kind of problem solve a little bit. It's been really fun. Oh, I love your honesty. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. you know, virtually teaching wasn't exactly in your mindset to start because I think a lot of teachers could probably agree with you. Right. right. So Absolutely. Um, Jen, one of the things that you had mentioned in our intake um, questionnaire was the, the concept of really using books at the beginning of the year. Can you talk a little bit more about why um, that's so important? Well, I feel like as teachers, our jobs at any time of the year, but especially at the beginning time of the year, we're trying to build rapport. We're trying to build relationships and we're trying to model expectations for our students. So if coming into the beginning of the year, you're modeling reading tons of books, questioning books, you know, talking about books, that's going to get your, your students wanting to do it as well. That just whole modeling aspect of a teacher reading a story, thinking out loud to the students and thinking, hmm, I wonder why our character just did that, you know, drawing some conclusions from things. And just, I love that modeling that can happen that can lead to tons of literacy skills for comprehension. But then even just the importance, and I think even now more than ever, teachers are feeling that they need to build relationships in their classroom, it's especially for a lot of teachers that are stepping back into the classroom after maybe being virtual for a year. They're now trying to figure out ways, how do I connect with these students that maybe have not been in a classroom for a year, or maybe it's their first time in a classroom if they were a younger child that missed out on their kindergarten year and are coming into first grade and not really knowing what to expect from school. Um, and I think throughout a lot of what happened with our country, a lot of different perspectives were brought out and people were made more aware of, you know, where people are coming from and what they're going through. And I think when you're able to kind of build those relationships in your classroom, you're really modeling for those students how it is in the real world. And that's another big core belief of mine is 
if we can do things in the classroom that are going to also emulate like a mini community for our students so that when they graduate and go out into the real world they're able to kind of take that skill and use it somewhere else then we're doing the right things as educators um, in providing them those things and i also think it's great for giving different perspectives you have a student on one side that may has lived different uh, paths of life than the one sitting next to them. And by reading stories, you can have them turn and talk and share those experiences with one another and kind of compare what's being read as well. That is fantastic. I, I just really love that. So it's not just building relationships, but thinking about the fact that some of these children have, haven't have exactly had the opportunity to be in a social setting in, in what is it, 18 months over, over that um, by the time we get back. So being able to teach them maybe social skills, social emotional learning, is that a, another part of what you do with your students? Absolutely. That is kind of part of a big base of everyday learning, especially in a special education classroom, although I think it should be in every classroom. Um, just understanding how we socially interact with one another, especially after a break like we've had. Um, being around other people and doing things, just relearning and modeling how those things should be done, understanding how we need to be accepting of other people and how they feel about things. Uh, maybe one person gets upset about a certain thing and somebody else just brushes it off. But I think learning about that and knowing that different people react in different ways and handle things differently and having that acceptance for one another is really important. And you can certainly model that reading stories to students, sharing stories that, you know, have those situations in, in them so that you can get students talking about it. So Jen, do you, as far as teaching special education, do you, and be completely honest here, because these are the people who can help solve problems, right, from the other right. end, the listeners here, but do you feel that there is um, a good enough of, amount of resources as far as books for the special, um, for the special education you know, field, uh, whether it's children in the stories being represented with dis right. disabilities, or if it's talking about certain disabilities. I can think of one book called Just Ask, and I apologize, I'm not remembering the author's name, but it talks about several different things that are common for children, um, whether it's a food allergy or diabetes right. or asthma. And so it kind of walks through that in a picture book format, but how do you feel about other, you know, do we have a good enough of, of resources, good enough amount of resources? Well, I will say in the last few years, um, I'm going into my 13th year of teaching. And uh, like you had shared, my first four years, I just taught in a regular education elementary classroom, two years in first grade, two years in pre-K, which of course, that's a place where you're reading tons of picture books um, to, your, to your students. And at that time, if you would have asked me that question, I would have said, no, there's not enough. And even now, I still don't think there's enough books out there. Um, I do think it's gotten better. I think there are some more disability awareness books that you can read to your class talking about different types of disabilities. I do think children with disabilities are being more represented in not just books about disability awareness, but just overall books. Um, with children. So I do think that we're starting to get to a place where that's becoming more of a norm so that we're seeing and giving our, our children examples of those things. Because like I said, that's real world. You are going to be out in your community doing different things and everybody's got their things going on that they're doing, whether it's a physical disability or, or something they struggle with cognitively. Um, but I don't think there's as, we could still use more. We could totally use more. Um, we could really use things that help kids understand a little bit more of like the why. So, you know, maybe mm -hmm. I, I've seen some children's books, for example, um, I work with the, mostly uh, the autistic population of students, but things like, you know, why is that student rocking back and forth? Why is that student flapping their hands? Because I will say even for my own neurotypical children, seeing a child like that out in the community, they, they kind of don't get it. They don't understand you know, why they're doing that. They might be a little nervous if they see a kid doing that on a playground. And just because of my background, I can go over to them and say, you know, oh, that's just how he calms himself down. Or that's how she, you know, uh, can do something so she can handle maybe some of the noises that are going on outside. Or that's just how she regulates her body and those types of things. Also, um, normalizing that disabilities aren't just one gender or another. I know, especially with autism, it's very um known that it mostly is common in boys but it also can be for girls and having books for those for for those girls that mm -hmm. want to have that representation for themselves 
And then also, you know, for other students to read too that, you know, and the other concept I think um, that I haven't seen a ton as well is that not every disability is visible. So understanding yes. that just because you don't see physically a disability on a person does not mean that they don't have something that, that you know, they're working through or struggling with um, or trying to overcome. So. Yeah, and we're actually recording this um, just a few days after gymnast um, Simone uh, had announced that she was pulling out because of um, she was struggling with some mental, right? Mental. I'm and I'm struggling with the words today, but you've been really taking my jumbled questions <laughs> and putting them so beautifully. But um, I think that's going to be a beautiful example that. Right. It, like we can't see her mental struggles. We right. can see that physical aspect, but it doesn't mean that they aren't there. Right. Oh, that is just, and you know, I think uh, as a parent too, so you said you could go over to the curious child and say, you know, this is why hands are flapping. This is why noises are being made or someone's covering their ears. But I think reading picture books is also helpful to the parent who may not have right. that experience and to remind the child that it's okay to be curious or to remind the parent that it's okay for their children to be curious, but how do you encourage that curiosity without, you know, um, squashing it, but encourage it in an appropriate way? Yeah, and as a parent, you're also showing your child your acceptance. So if you're willing to read that book with your child, you're showing you, you want them to learn this, you're accepting of this as well, which is providing a great model as a parent, um, you know, and those books weren't around when I was a kid for my parents to do that for me. No. Um, but it's becoming more and more visible. The other thing, now that I'm thinking about it even more, just because I've worked a lot with the secondary population, is books that aren't always so clip art graphic-y, or if they are, to a more mature extent, because we do have students that are in, you know, the 6 to 12 grade range, that may cognitively be able to understand concepts such as uh, an elementary student would, but they're older. So having books that those students can relate to, you know, at a level they're at, but also um, being more mature, maybe more like a comic, I know is a, is a route that a lot of books will tend to go if they're gearing it towards the older ages, but still trying to keep it at their level. Um, I'm a big believer and love uh, using real photographs in my stories, in my visuals, in my own classroom for those older students, one for generalization so that they actually learn what things were. Sometimes cartoons and clip art can be a little deceiving on what they actually mean in things mm -hmm. when you're using them. But um, real photos for things like life skills activities, teaching how to wash hands, teaching how to you know, do a job, different career exploration books that would be geared towards maybe secondary students that have disabilities that are um, learning about careers so that when they graduate, they can decide if they would like to, you know, be a bagger at a grocery store or, you know, be a custodian at a school. So informational text as well, I think is something maybe I just, I, I don't recall seeing a ton of that, but for that secondary population would be really cool. And Jen, Let's ask the big question, because I think this is the question that publishers are really wondering. How do teachers like yourself find books? How do you discover new books? Where are the different places you're looking or hearing about stories? Well, I would say a lot of where I'm finding information, I'm really connected to the Instagram community, and that has kind of exploded over the last few years. Um, with teachers, you know, becoming more and more on Instagram, TikTok's another one that's kind of starting to blow up too. Um, and there's a lot of teachers there that will share um, books that they really enjoy, um, that they like to use things for, you know, social emotional learning or ones that they use. There's a few teachers I follow that um, will share about using books um, in the middle school grade levels and even using picture books with that age population and not you know, saying just because it's a picture book, it shouldn't be used in a sixth grade classroom. There's ways to tweak it and teach it and, and make it functional and work for that. that and for text, it's great. Yeah, uh, yep, absolutely. Great. Yep, to model for writing and things like that. I did that when I taught first grade, we did a lot of mentor text where we would read books and then use that for writing lessons. Um, and then I would just say Amazon is another place, blogs, you know, teach, there's a lot of teachers out there that will write blogs about books that they like to use in their classroom. Um, so, you know, and a basic Amazon search, but again, that testimonial piece for me, like if another teacher has done it, I know because of their skill set as a teacher, 
I'm probably more likely to listen to their testimonial on what they think of a book if I see that they're also using it. And I bet, I bet you're reading reviews too on Amazon. If you're trying to decide whether or not you want to get a book, you're probably taking a look at that just to solidify, you know, whether or not you're going to purchase it. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So Jen, so many great pointers today. I really appreciate it. And again, you just say it so lovely. You make it, you make it so that we can really grasp the concept of um, diversity in the area of disabilities too, and really being able to represent all children so that all children feel welcomed and um, special and loved. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your email list because we're going to need to put a link to it in our show notes. Okay. And I know you offer a lot of really helpful things there. So tell us a little bit about what, what is there. Well, in my email list, I provide that on a weekly basis. So every week, um, any readers that would take part in it would get information from me on latest blog posts that I've written on my website. So you get updates on different topics that I'm covering right now. We're doing a lot of uh, back to school type things, classroom setup, what kind of things do you need in your classroom to start the year? Um, a lot of teachers talking about building schedules and things like that. Um, and that kind of changes seasonally as the year goes. I also like to uh, share some tips and ideas, different hacks and things that teachers can use in their classroom, whether it's an orga organizational hack or a storage hack, something like that that's kind of something that they can take away from that email and do with something they can take action with right away. Um, and then also I offer exclusive freebies in my email list. And then I also um, offer some paid products as well. If you find something you like that we talk about in the email and you wanna you know, go over and purchase it to use in your classroom or at home, I have a lot of parents as well that utilize my resources. Um, you can find out about those as well. Fantastic. And we know where to find you. We're going to find you on Instagram. We're also going to link Facebook and Pinterest, okay. but on Instagram, tell us your handle. My handle on Instagram is teach love autism. Jen Adams, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in every Tuesday. We have a new episode and next week, you never know who's going to be sharing with us, but we are in the current series of educators sharing all about how they use the, their stories and the books that they find in the classroom, what they use books in the classroom for and how they find them. Thanks so much, Jen. Mm -hmm.